You are about to be amazed by four amazing leaders in our region. So take it over, Teresa. Would like to have the mics on, please. Oh. In the back. Yeah, we need mics. There we go. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Everyone, welcome to our closing panel, Defining Your Leadership Legacy. Now, I have a confession. I really had not thought much about this whole concept of leaving a leadership legacy until Melissa asked me to moderate this panel several months ago. So, of course, I did a little homework. Now, if you want a definition of a leadership legacy, here it is. Your leadership legacy is defined by how others approach work and life as a result of having worked with you. That is according to Robert Galford and Regina Maruca, authors of the book, Your Leadership Legacy. They wrote the book on it. <laughs> now, these two authors also say that considering your legacy looking to the future now will make you a better leader today. That is because the actions that you take today will shape how you are measured in the future. So get ready for our panelists to inspire you as they discuss how their mentors <laughs> left their legacy, the twists and turns of their own leadership legacy journey, and what they are doing to lift up other women around them as leaders. It is our hope that their stories will give you some tools and tactics, some steps that you can be taking right now to define your own leadership legacy, no matter what position you hold right now. So let us meet the panelists. First, we have Nan Whaley, who is our city of Dayton mayor, there you go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Nan has served in the public sector for 20 years almost and is a Wright State University That's so graduate. That's terrible. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's all good. She is a Wright State University graduate with a degree in chemistry. She has been our mayor for nearly four years. She says she is committed to having Dayton become a city of learners. And mm -hmm. what a good example we have here today. In May, she announced she is running for the Democratic Party nomination for governor in 2018. Nan Whaley. Thank you, Tisha. Next to Nan is Dr. Cassie Barlow. She is the director of the Aerospace Professional Development Center at the Southwestern Ohio Council for Higher Education. Yay, Yay Cassie. <laughs> what does that really mean? That means that Cassie works across Ohio to ensure our state's workforce needs for aerospace and defense are met. She is absolutely perfect for this position since she holds a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology from Rice University, along with several other degrees. And she also has served in the United States Air Force, where she applied her skills in human resources, strategic planning, budget development, and workforce development. Cassie Barlow. Yay, Cassie. <laughs> Next to Cassie is our own Shannon Isom. She is the CEO of YWCA Dayton, a position she accepted in 2013 after serving on the board of directors there for almost four years. Before joining the Y, she spent 15 years in healthcare in sales, business development, systems integration, and business and clinical integration. She has an MBA in healthcare administration from Northeastern University's DeMore McKim School of Business in Boston. Welcome, Shannon. Yay, Shannon. Next to Shannon is Anita Emhoff, CEO of Boost Technologies, which is comprised of Shumsky, a top 50 promotional products distributor, and Boost Rewards, a technology platform for employee recognition programs. Mm. Last month, Anita's company was named number one on the top advertising agencies list by the Dayton Business Journal. Mm. 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 And there is more. Boost Technologies once again made it on Inc. Magazine's Inc. 500, mm. which ranks the nation's fastest growing private companies. 
She is a native of Denmark, and she brings her European style to the company, which is known for blending culture and strategic planning with operational excellence. Welcome, Anita. Anita. Obviously, we have a wonderful, awesome panel, so let's start asking them some questions. We want to talk first, ladies, about the leadership legacy of others. I'd like you to think about a leader in your life who has left a tremendous leadership legacy. And we'd like to talk about what was this person's impact on the organization. And you can describe that any way you like. And I'm looking at Cassie, so you get to go first. Certainly, thank you. Um, I want to start off by thanking Melissa and her team for an awesome day today. Ladies, wasn't today awesome? <laughs> So thanks to the team, because I know these things don't just happen. Um, so let me talk about a leader from my very early uh, career when I was in my early 20s, who um, to this day is a model for me. And he was one of my first bosses uh, when I was in the Air Force. And he just had a way of making every member of the team feel important and feel like they had a role um, to completing the mission of the organization. And uh, he did this in many, many different ways. Um, but I will, I will never forget watching how good he was at that. And um, throughout my career, I've tried to um, emulate him uh, regularly because he just, he was one of those people that everybody wanted to be around because uh, when you were around him, you just felt good. Mm -hmm. uh, you felt like a part of the team. You felt like you could accomplish anything. And uh, he was just, I think, probably the, the best um, example of leadership that I've seen in my career. And ended up becoming a mentor of mine and that, that ha who has mentored me for many, many years. And um, I, like I said, I've tried to emulate him and to, to do similar things to make everybody feel like part of the team. Because I think when everybody feels like they have a role on the team and they understand what their role is in the big picture, uh, they can better help perform the mission of the organization. So that would be my example. Can you give us an example of a behavior that he demonstrated that showed that everybody, he made people feel important yeah. in a behavior? Yeah, so at simplest little things like regularly getting out and visiting uh, his very large organization, thousands of people in this organization, and he took time for everybody. He stopped and talked with people. He learned your, the family name, mem you know, the, the members of the family, their names. Um, and would regularly ask questions and connect with people. So in doing that, in regularly visiting offices around the, the installation that we worked at, uh, there, was, there was every organization on that base was important in meeting the mission. And everybody felt that because he didn't matter where you worked, either whether you worked on the flight line or whether you were in the post office, it didn't matter. Your job was important and he made sure that you knew your job was important and that we couldn't get the job done at that base without you. Mm -hmm. And so just regular, regular visits, talking with people and connecting, having that connection and being comfortable in making that connection. Um, and he did that regularly. And that was, a be that was a behavior that I'll never forget. And it sounds really simple, um, but it's not when you have a really large organization. It's very difficult to do that. You need to be very concerted, make a concerted effort to do those types of things. That, that's a great example, and, and I like how you made that intentional. You have to go out of your way almost to, to do that, so that's wonderful. Shannon, what about yes. you? Is there a leader in your life who has left a legacy? And tell us about yeah, this Yeah, I, I was thinking about that question, and, and I think my initial reaction is, and I've said this before, I have multiple leaders. I don't think there's any one particular person that embodies all the things that I strive to be. But if I have to narrow it down, I would say, as Cassie, it was very early in, before I was in my career, so at college, we had a president at our college, and her name is President Janetta Cole, and, and for, she, she's still a president of a college, but for me, I think that what really struck um, me about her leadership style and has left, and I continue to aspire to be that, 
is that she first called you by your name, not your name of Shannon. She called each one of us her Spellman sisters, and that's how she would greet you. And so in a lot of ways, you formed um, a strong affinity for the team. For us, it was a small African-American, historically black woman's college that I was at. And so you, she, she called you what she knew you to be. Um, and I think for me, working at the YW, that was, that's important. And I, I, I want to walk the walk of calling women who sometimes are called everything but their name to call them women. And I think that's important. And I want to, I want I strive to make sure that I treat each of the women that within our building that connect with our services that they feel like women. And not all the other things we call mm -hmm. them. The second thing I remember um, and still hold very true is that she was, for me, the embodiment of what I hadn't seen before, wasn't able to touch, which was a African-American woman leader who boldly was who she was. Um, she didn't wear her hair straight. She did not wear clothing that I think overall would um, make her sensible or palatable in the business community. She was um, herself. And um, it really was quite impactful because at that age, um, growing up in an all-white community, I hadn't seen that before. And so I still then, in a lot of ways, how it translates for me is I have to be true to who I am, even um, at times when it's easier to be more palatable for others. And that's tough, but I hope that um, true. And then the third thing was that she always, and I think you said that, it, it, you always felt better because you were around her. You just wanted to be more, and you couldn't wait to run <coughs> to be that. Um, and although I don't always um, act in the way that uh, makes it easy <laughs> for people to come, I do strive for that, that especially the women of the YW and or those women that have not felt loved, I strive to be a person that is approachable and um, caring uh, and empathetic and look women in the eye and touch them and make sure they feel that they're touched. What I like about what both of them have shared so far is that the impact happened early in their career. Have you noticed that? So early in their career, very interesting. Nan, what about you? Who is somebody that has left a legacy for you? Well, for me, I was very lucky to, um, just out of college here at Dayton, to have a group of women called Women in Leadership that really uh, worked intentionally to work with uh, promoting women into Leadership, or leadership roles in nonprofits and businesses and in uh, uh, political positions. But they also uh, did that work at the same time. They, they looked for younger women that would, they'd want to mentor. And so these, this group of women uh, basically raised me in the community, I would say, uh, and really took an interest in me. And there was a number of them, a number of them still are raising me, frankly, uh, uh, to, to do my best and to really uh, sound off. And uh, what for me has been great is, I, you know, you mentioned I've been doing this work for 20 years, which I guess is true, and it's a little <laughs> shocking for me. I didn't really realize that until today, uh, is that, you know, I can tell, like, a lot of times they've, they've, you know, as they've still been a part of this process with me, that they're super proud of the work we're doing. And, that I think that is very exciting for me that you know they're still such a key part of my life and such a key part of you know um, telling me when I fall short or when I um, uh, have been able to do good work and I think that's what's really important is you know um, these relationships are about you know people that have strong leadership I think there's a lot of honesty in that and a, a lot of authenticity and I think those are the key parts of uh, having having good leadership skills, and then also having strong mentors that do that as well. So I'm curious, can you share a story about how they raised you? Can you give an example there? Oh my gosh. Something well, like, that... they, like, they've even dressed me, I have to be honest. So <laughs> I'm, ter I'm terrible at like, shopping. I'm not very good at it at all. And so, I mean, through my whole life, there's a woman that um, actually, like, to this day, she still takes me shopping. So. Um, uh, they do that, which is, you know, kind of embarrassing, frankly, because I'm so bad at it. Uh, but uh, they do that to just like, I mean, I remember, I mean, 
Uh, I, I'm a pretty loud person, frankly, and you know, I had to grow up. Uh, I was elected at 29, so I've grown up pretty publicly uh, through uh, the city. And I remember like uh, one time they, they said, okay, we're gonna take you to a nice restaurant and uh, make sure that you, uh, you know, aren't so loud in this restaurant. I mean, they would <laughs> literally do this for me, right? So, um, I, I mean, that, that's a pretty honest conversation yeah. that they've done. But then also, you know, just given me great opportunities to, uh, you know, work on my leadership and learn through making mistakes and always being there. I think that that's been something they've done that's been great. We, we all need folks to watch out for us, right? I mean, so take that advice, ladies. <laughs> Anita, who is someone in your life who has left a legacy for you? Yeah, so it's interesting, my journey in terms of impact on leadership didn't happen before later. You know, so I left Denmark when I was 21 and traveled all over the world and, and didn't so much interact with leaders, but more at what I call hard knocks of life, figuring things out on your own as you're like trying to figure out what you want. I knew I had a lot of passion, and, but I didn't really know where to channel it or even where to kind of approach it. So when I first time stepped into a management role within our organization, I kind of had a rude awakening in terms of my style. It was, uh, it was not, um, it was not appreciated. <laughs> I, um, I decided to use my Danish mentality of shooting from the hip, and that, that is, does not work over here. So my husband, which is Michael Emhoff, and a really phenomenal mentor of my li in my life as well, and still am, and I'm not going to highlight him today. I'm sorry, Michael, but um, he did say, I think you need help. And I'm like, yeah, I think you do. <laughs> so I decided to approach Aileron and go through the president's course. And that's where I met the first leader that truly impacted me and realized what powerful tools I really had through my passion. Mm -hmm. and, and truly, if we understand how to utilize our passion and channel it systematically, you can impact a lot of people in your organization as well as a lot of people around you. So he really got to me in a way that he said, Anita, the passion that you have and the beliefs that you have, you, you need to learn how to communicate that and share that and get people to understand where you're going and your vision and in your roadmap. And if you don't align those people with your vision and your communication skill set, that they're just not gonna care about where you wanna go and you're gonna lose. You can't just go and tell them, do this and do that and be tactical with them. So I am so thankful for him because he truly understood what it means to be passionate and seeing him interacting with his people, he just made everything so hard look effortless. And I'm like, you just turned this completely fire drill into a dance. How did you do that? I mean, I was just so amazed with his patience and his calm demeanor, and and then I'm a little bit the same way. I can be all over the board. You're not all over the board. I am all <laughs> over the board. But passion can be can become like all these little butterflies, and you know, I still have to work on that today. But continuously working on channeling that passion that you have um, to leave the right message with the people and and understanding it is okay to be passionate, but just rein it in sometimes a little right. bit. Mm -hmm. So I loved how you told that story about uh, he made it look effortless. Yes. So did you learn by observing him, or did he sit you down and say, here's what you might want to try? He, it was a little bit of both, and then quite frankly, creating a system. And you know, he has what he called his five Ps, and I live like that. You know, it's, it's passion, it's people, it's processes, and it's performance metrics. You know, just always aligning your passion with your people, create process and performance metrics around it, and you'll be all right. No, it's a little bit more in detail than that, but, um, but that's tr what I try and live with. And I don't think it matters if you run an organization or it's your own self. You know, if you understand what your passion is and what your planning is going to be and what you want to do, and then you align the people, whether it's your family or it's your organization, and then you create some metrics around it to keep you on track. I mean, that's 
kind of a no-brainer nearly, right? So some of those things I've adapted both into the organization and the people and, and just in general my family as well. So it's a no-brainer, but yet sometimes we need yeah. reminders, so that's, yeah. that's great. All right, so you kind of are leading us into our journey, and so you kind of gave us a taste of where we're going next. We'd like them now to talk about their own leadership legacy journey. They've shared with us how their mentors have impacted them. So let's, let's talk with Shannon on this one. So let's talk with Shannon about uh, your own journey. As a result of having worked with that leader, and you said you were impacted by many people, how did your own approach begin to change? And can you give us some examples of maybe how you started to change your behavior by some of the people that you observed? What did you start to do yourself from your own leadership journey perspective? Gosh, that's such a full question. Let's see. It's all about behaviors. Okay. How did you change your behavior? So I think the first thing that I have to say as we talk about legacy are even those people who not only affirm who you are, but also affirm what you don't want to be. Hmm. And I think that as I've gone through my own legacy journey, it would be remiss for, I think, probably all of us to not consider the journey of when you've gotten the feedback, <laughs> or you've gotten the lessons that doesn't quite fit well with who you are. So I would say the beginning part of my legacy journey, and I would say probably 15 years of it, less now, and I think it's just because I'm older, not because people have less to say. I think it's just harder to say it the older you get, or maybe the more cantankerous you get, I don't, I don't know, but I think it's harder for people to tell me. But I think a, a, a good portion of it was the feedback that I got that I was trying to be the, the, the performance measures that I was asked to do. And I think a lot of that in the beginning, in your 20s and your 30s, is you're seeking and yearning to do the best you can in whatever position you are based on whatever that perspective of success looks like in the environment and the culture of the people that you're around. And overall, from a performance standard, I was successful. But what I wasn't as successful as was the behavior. I was always a little off with the behavior. And I was a little off with the behavior because, as I look back on it now, I was a little too disruptive. I was not subservient enough for the team. I did not play um, the dynamics of the culture of knowing how to softly, behaviorally be successful in the environment. And so what I took upon myself is to change my behavior as, as much as I could, but the problem is, is I couldn't really change it, so there was frustration on both sides. I ended up at the YW it, it, in a position, a leadership position, and not because I sought after it, but in essence, that is what was happening, is that with each piece of me not quite fitting, what ultimately was happening is that I was, although I was feeling like I was not fitting in anywhere, although performing well, it ultimately was making me one step closer to really what I was supposed to do, which was not necessarily be at the Y, which it is, but to be in a position of leadership. And not because leading was the job, it was because I needed to be able to be who I authentically what am, which is very passionate, um, very direct, um, but also very, very much um, in my own voice, in my own disruption, um, feeling like there's service delivery that needs to show up differently than what we've ever done before. And how do you do that in traditional systems that is in a traditional conservative community like ours. I think probably Nan and Cassie and Amy have probably all been in situations where they're the traditionalism or the conservatism potentially of who we are, I mean, of where we are. You've had to make a decision if you're going to go along with that or not. And then take, you know, take the heat for that. So I, I think that in answering that, my behavior, um, probably has undulated between modifications and plain, um, at times, looking insubordinate. And that's 
<laughs> the truth. And that's, that's, that's your the journey. truth. That's my journey. But where I am today is that even within those modifications, I needed the lesson because there are situations I am where I have to modify my behavior. And there are situations that I'm in today that it allows me to say that I won't. And in another, that, that, that I will be able to lead, but in another culture could look insubordinate. But yet, my position today looks like I'm leading. So I think we always have to balance that. Right, you gotta, you gotta balance that. So my journey is not anywhere near over. Um, I'm still learning, I'm still learning about myself. But I would say that's part of it. That was part of my behavior. So that's really interesting. Um, you made a point that said you were a high performer, but you didn't feel like Very you high. were fitting in. Yeah. So there's an incredible amount of self-awareness, I think, that you've shared, that you were able to recognize and kind of piece that apart. So, so very interesting. Um, Nan, what about you? What about your journey? And, and you can talk about behaviors, maybe, that you started to you know, form yourself, your own journey. What's your story? So I think, like Shannon, I'm a very aggressive person. And um, I'm still in pretty aggressive. Uh, and I don't look at that word as a bad word. I like being aggressive. It's really fun. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think when I was younger, um, I would be aggressive for the sake of aggressiveness. And I think that was something I had to learn to kind of check, frankly. Uh, and you know, now I think you know, what I've been able to do in understanding how to you know, use leadership is to figure out the place that I want to be aggressive and then really push really hard on. And then the other thing that I think one of the big lessons I learned is I would like not pass up any single fight. And uh, you're not, I mean, you really shouldn't take every single fight. And so uh, particularly in, uh, in like government and political pieces, uh, recognizing which, which ones were the best ones. I mean, not to necessarily say you would win them, but like you lose too, but which ones were really valuable to go after. And I think that, you know, one of the issues with leadership is there's just only so much bandwidth you have. And so you have to really be conscious of what is really important, uh, what issue, uh, what, what part of, um, of the work that you really want to make a difference in and, and go deep. And I think that's, um, that's really my favorite thing to do, frankly, is to go very deep on, on issues and go very deep on, on a, a place. Uh, uh, but that's a big challenge, right? Because you know, particularly in the work that I do, it can be pretty wide. And uh, when, when you're picking every single fight, you can't get anything done. So. <laughs> Uh, that has been a great lesson for me on behaviors. So more self-awareness, and I'm curious to wonder, what is a fight that was worth it to you? Because you, you pick your battles. We learned that from our parents. What's a fight that was worth it to you that you dug deep and went all in, a fight that was worth it? Well, I think certainly the work that we've done on City of Learners would be an example. Mm -hmm. uh, when you know, I was elected mayor, uh, the first thing we were, I think, in this room, and it was uh, like five degrees. Uh, outside, not in here. But anyway, uh, uh, I came in and uh, at, at our swearing in, I said, you know, Dayton should become a city of learners committed to lifelong learning. And most of the city staff looked at me like, what? Uh, we don't do education. That's not what we do at City Hall. We have no control over this. We thought she was really smart. What is she thinking of doing? And you know, really had to work in the organization for them to see the value of what education can do for our community, even if we don't run that program, uh, and you know, really try to coalesce the community about it. And it's still, it's still a fight we're taking uh, to change um, the mindset of folks about the role this, the city and the whole community have around education. Uh, and you know, I think that then, you know, last year we were able to pass uh, universal pre-K for every single four-year-old that's high quality. Uh, if we hadn't taken that fight three years ago and really worked at that and worked deep in it um, and got other leaders to buy in, which is really important when you're leading a community, you never do this work alone, uh, that, I, I think that was an example of a fight worth taking. That, that's awesome. So I'm going to give you a hand mm -hmm. for that because that's a great accomplishment for sure. Mm -hmm. Y'all did it, right, Cassie? Mm -hmm. okay. All righty. Cassie, your leadership legacy journey. Yeah, so I think that... that journey started as I was observing this leader that I talked about earlier, and that led me to really be a student of leadership. 
Hmm. And not only to read voraciously about the topic, but to also watch very closely um, to learn from leaders. As many good things as I learned on what you definitely should do as a leader, I also learned just as many things that you should never ever do as a leader. And you can learn as many lessons from those people, yeah. unfortunately, as you can from the, the good ones. So that was the first step. And what I recognized in watching and in reading is that, um, you know, very well sh stated by Shannon that, that you need to be true to yourself. You can't try to be somebody else. So you can read every book in the world and think, I, well, I just need to follow what this book says and I need to follow what that book says and I need to follow what that book says. But at the end of the day, you need to be yourself. You need to be authentic because if you come across as being anybody but yourself, nobody trusts you and they're not gonna follow you. So that's the first thing I learned that I really need to just be myself. And I started to watch people's reaction and I, needed, and I started to ask for feedback, both formal and informal feedback. And through doing that, I learned a lot about myself uh, in becoming a leader. And I think understanding who you are as a leader is incredibly important. Uh, you can't really lead effectively until you understand who you are so lots of reflection there. And then, you know, the, the core, I would say, uh, to leadership that, that I learned over time and um, tried to build within every organization I, I was in um, is trust. Uh, you cannot be an effective leader if you're not trusted. Um, and there has to be a, a mutual trust in the organization, uh, top down and bottom up. And so, so every organization I went into, I started there. Um, you know, here's who I am, here's where I'm coming from, uh, and, and I have the same goals that you have, and, and let's move forward together. And you st start day by day building, building that trust. And um, through those behaviors, um, I was able to, um, you know, progress through leadership roles and responsibilities and um, really probably the most important thing that I learned over time is, um, you know, that, and this is a, this is a great Maya Angelou uh, quote that, that I will never forget and I, I really think about uh, as in every leadership role that I've been in and that is, she said that she's learned that, you know, people forget, will forget what you said and people will forget what you do, what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. And if you think about that as a leader, and if you think about, um, you know, trying to, um, you know, think about what you do, how, how that makes others feel, uh, I think that that leads to very effective leaders and very effective leadership. So I'm intrigued by this idea of trust because there's a lot of, uh, lot of talk in the media about trust. From a behavior standpoint, can you give us some examples of what you did to build trust? Because that's hard to get. It's hard to earn. And I'm certain you did some very yeah. intentional things to build trust with your team. Yeah, so, so it really goes back to, you know, coming up together as a team with a shared vision and, and then following through on that vision. And then when something happens, if something goes awry, you know, having the courage to stand up and say, hey, look, you know, I messed this up. This didn't go exactly the way we planned. Um, but let's, you know, let's reset. Let's start over. And, um, you know, having, being able to have conversations like that um, really helps with building trust. Uh, so being a leader who's, who's humble enough to say, hey, this didn't work. Uh, um, that builds trust um, and and then the the people around you in the organization start to feel that that there's trust enough for them to be able to take risks and um, to be able to step outside of bounds sometimes and um, really to really help move the organization forward so I, I just think trust is critical in in an organization so I, I agree, and I really like what you said about being humble and admitting if something didn't work. Is there a risk that you took that maybe didn't go as planned that really brought that lesson home for your team? I mean, is there an example you could give us? Several. <laughs> <laughs> we would be here all day. <laughs> uh, yes, several. 
um, that that I can think of that um, you know coming to coming to that conclusion as a team um, you know we took this risk together uh, it didn't work how do we go back and learn from that lesson not not make that mistake again and then move the entire team forward um, but I think you know as a, as the leader sitting at the end of the table you need to be the first one to be able to say mea culpa um, all fingers point at you at sitting at the end of the table as the leader um, nowhere else and um, if you're not willing to, to take those, all those fingers pointing in your direction, then you're sitting in the wrong chair. Uh, and, and it's very, very important to be able to, um, um, to, to, be able to step up and say, that, that just didn't work the way I had, I had hoped and I had planned, but we're gonna fix it. We're gonna, fi we're gonna fix it and um, we're gonna move together, move forward together. And so with that kind of an attitude, you're almost building a bank of trust as, as those types of things happen. So that's, that's wonderful. Anita, what about you? We're going to talk about your journey and maybe some behaviors. How have you started to behave differently? And you kind of gave us a hint to where you were going with your own journey. So tell us about behaviors. I still that... don't behave. <laughs> <laughs> I try. <laughs> well, I, th I think... I think you ladies said something, self-reflection is like the first step in anything. I don't care what mentor you meet or leader you meet, if you're not willing to accept what they're telling you, you're not gonna be able to move forward. Even though how hard it can be and how bad the information is that they're telling you, if you're not willing to accept it and move forward, it ain't gonna happen. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. So that was my first, like, first three days I was in denial. I was like, they don't know what they're talking about. They can't be wrong. And then I'm like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe they're right. So I realized that my people was really, truly the way I was gonna leave a legacy. And I needed to start communicating with them better. So what I did was I started to interview every one of them. I wanted to know their passions. I wanted to know their desires. I wanted to know why they were in our organization and where they wanted to go. I wanted them to share the same roadmap that I had. You know, their aspiration, what kind of value proposition they think they could bring to the organization. And it was amazing how many people that I found were sitting in one position, but really had a passion about doing something else. I had one young lady, she was sitting in customer service, and she had project management experience as well as, as well as design experience. And I'm like, what are you doing over here? <laughs> you know, let's get you transitioned over. But I think it enabled me to truly listen, like step back, open your mind, understand that somebody is gonna take the way you think or the way you deliver your vision or mission or roadmap in different ways. They all process things differently. And I only had one speed and it was fast. I had no other <laughs> speeds. So I needed to adjust my dial a little bit and say, well, an introvert that are very process oriented is gonna need a little bit more hand holding and cuddling than potentially a my game off that just needs, I just need the pie in the sky and don't give in there in the detail. You know, but learning that skill set was hard. And it was because I, I was so passionate, I'm like, can't you see it? It's so clear right in front of me. And why can you not understand what it is I wanna do? So, but I thought that was the most uplifting experience I could ever go through because I really truly got to know anybody, everybody and I got to learn a lot about myself. So I self-reflected and I just literally became a lot better person and, and a better communicator and more patient and just more loving as well. You know, just caring about, not that I didn't care about people, but I thought, honestly, I thought success was about how fast you could go. It was all about just like plow. I just gotta be the best at it. I gotta be the best performance at it. And who cares about people? You know, it's like, let's just get there. Cause that's what I was taught. And that's the world I had lived in for nearly 15 years. It was all survival mode, and it was me first and put everybody second, because that's how I would get through to the next day. So when suddenly you have to interact with people, 
and get him to listen to you and understanding what the path is going to be, then it becomes a little challenging, but definitely a, a must. So that was very, I was very thankful for that. So where did you get the idea to go literally, I'm assuming you had coffee, lunch, you talked with the employees, you had meetings. Um, where did you get that idea since, you, like you said, your style was different? Did your mentor give you that idea? Well, I decided I had to go completely opposite of what I would have done. Okay. So I thought <laughs> it had to be opposite. Right? <laughs> so one, one of the things I've always done in my whole life, every challenge, especially if it was a challenge, or I was about to fail or failed, or I was not good at it, I'm like, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna figure it out, and the only way I'm gonna figure it out is talk to people. So I thought that was the, I didn't know if it was gonna work, by the way, I had no clue. But I thought this, this might be the way I'm gonna do it. And even today, the way we operate and, and our, how our culture is, and how our leaders has entered into our organization are all completely aligned with the same philosophy about you're bringing people together around culture, you collaborate, and then you execute the plan. And I am so proud of seeing just what the organization has become because of those people. But That's a great example. So sometimes do the opposite of what you're accustomed to doing. That's great insight. Yeah. All right, let's shift to women that you are now lifting up, folks that you are empowering. So you, you've got your journey, and we're all obviously still on a journey. But I'm wondering, is there a particular person that you have in mind that you are working with from a leadership standpoint? Maybe you're helping this person with mod behavior modification, for example, or something that you're doing to mentor this person because perhaps you see leadership qualities in this person. And if you could give some examples. So lifting up other women. And we'll start with Cassie this time. She's very thoughtful over here. <laughs> So yes, I can think of one um, one person in particular. I, I, um, first of all, I think mentorship is is incredibly important, and I think informal mentorship is um, is the best way to go. Um, so what I've tried to do throughout my career is um, find women that um, and, and men um, that were were interested in a mentorship relationship and that um, I really was able to connect with cause, because I think um, in order to have a good mentoring relationship, you need to be able to really connect with that person. So this one, this person um, in particular is um, on, a, on a track, uh, I believe, um, to be a, um, a senior leader within an organization uh, in the future. I think she has the, um, the capacity uh, to, to get to a, a senior position. Uh, she's still working her way up. And uh, so we, we meet regularly at, at least once a month uh, over breakfast, lunch, coffee, uh, typically, and have regular conversations about what's going on at work and reflecting upon what's going on at work. How, I mean, you know, how could we have, how could she have handled a situation differently than she did? Um, you know, there was a conversation that we had about, uh, about pay, and it was a, it was a tough conversation, but uh, I, I just simply asked the question one day, so, you know, what's your pay like? And um, so we got into a conversation about people at her level, and was she getting similar pay to people at her level, and we very quickly realized that she wasn't, mm -hmm. and so I said, okay, what are we going to do about it? And she just kind of looked at me like, what do you mean? What are we going to do about it? And um, so we went through a process of actually building. I mean, I understood the organization that she worked with. She worked in um, uh, very intimately, actually. And I, I knew what she was, what a challenge she was up against. And I knew that if she didn't take an objective stance uh, to them, if there was any subjectivity involved at all, she wasn't going to get where she needed to go. So we actually worked together on a presentation that was um, really good. <laughs> and she took this presentation to her boss and uh, she called me that night and she said, I got promoted. <laughs> oh, I, got, I got more money and I got promoted. And I was like, what? It, so it, it worked and it, it worked because we took the time and we took the energy to kind of walk through and to tackle the problem very objectively 
Um, so that's what we do together. We just take the time to, to talk about what's going on at work, what's coming up next, how she's feeling about things, how she's feeling as a mom, because she's a young single mom, so lots of struggles there, uh, and is, is just doing phenomenally. Just got, get, just got promoted into a new position uh, where she's doubled her pay from her last position, so, so things are going very, very well, and I'm just glad to be a part of that and to be able to assist her in moving up the, you know, moving up in, in responsibility and in pay. And, and um, I, I just know that she's going to be a, in, in a senior position someday. So that's a great story. And I'm wondering, how have you seen her behavior shift? I mean, you obviously yeah. gave her that idea to make that presentation. But what have you seen, yeah. if you think about, and I don't know if it's him or her, maybe it's her. You know, where ha have you seen the change in behavior? Yeah, so, so that's the best part. Uh, I've seen a um, timid, cautious uh, woman growing into, uh, and we're never 100% there, but growing into a, a very confident, um, strong, uh, powerful young lady who knows how to exert her, her power. Mm -hmm. um, and I took that from a talk earlier today. Is our speaker out there somewhere? Um, but she, she, so not in a, not in a, in an emotional way, but in a very objective way, a, able to exert her power. And um, she's just really grown in confidence, and it's been, it's been fun to watch. That's great. Well, that makes you proud when you can do that for somebody. And Nan, is there somebody that uh, you're working with from a, a journey standpoint? Okay. I want to be mentored by Cassie. That's what I'm excited. <laughs> um, uh, no, uh, uh, yeah, so I like to uh, mentor lots of folks. I'll say this. We have a lot of us are in a group of the Women's Leadership Collaborative of Greater Dayton, where, you know, again, uh, uh, when I became mayor and folks that have, again, helped me, I wanted to pay it forward. And so some of these women here are even part of that group. It's been very... Uh, very, uh, it's been great for me too just to see this organization come together, but we uh, bring around 15 to 20 women every year to do a retreat and then they work together through, uh, through the entire year and then join the organization uh, and we're in our third year in that. So that's been an exciting part of like being, I think we have to be formal and informal in mentoring of and supporting of uh, women leaders and so that's a formal way we do that. And then, you know, I think the other, the other piece is there are women that are, um, um, my equals, like, uh, and I, I mean, they run for office, and they're the one percent that are incredibly crazy that do this work, and so we we talk regularly and, and bounce things off, and so I think there's a mutual mentorship that goes on there, and then also uh, there are some young women that are have decided to be part of the government and political process across the country, and you know I will get. Um, We've pl I've placed them on internships and then they stay in touch. They always, when they're not, they used to live in Dayton and now they live across the country. They come back. Every time they come back uh, home, we make sure that we have lunch or dinner. Uh, and we've had these kind of conversations about making sure that they're getting paid appropriately and being very assertive and aggressive in that, uh, especially in the political system. That, that is, there are no rules really. And so you have to really uh, navigate that for each in, in situation. And so I've done that with a couple of women. and. Uh, you know, I think the other thing for me when I'm working uh, with younger women and uh, women uh, that are of the same, um, in the same place as I am, you know, I really just encourage people to take risks. And I think that that's one of the things that is, uh, I think, the most challenging for women leaders is um, we need to be riskier. And um, so generally, if someone calls me for advice, I feel like they already know I'm going to tell them to go like do something pretty extreme, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's usually the advice I'll give. I very seldom encourage people to step back. So, so I think that, and I've just noticed, I think that especially in leadership, uh, women do not use their own agency or voice enough mm -hmm. uh, to step in that place. And um, yes, I definitely try to encourage every single woman to do that. So. Mm -hmm. So that's great, and I, I have, you painted this picture of all these women that she's impacting, and I, I'm wondering, is there somebody that you feel like you've helped given a voice to, I mean, somebody that you really have encouraged to take a risk and she actually took it? Is there one example? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, just last week, there's one young woman, she's uh, working in D.C., and um, she, 
you know, most, most folks that work in po politics, they, they usually change jobs every 18 months or 24 months. It is a little risky kind of work and you win or lose. And so uh, she really likes her job and she was thinking of getting on this other race and she would have to move. But she really likes her job, but it was always her plan to go and grow into this next position. It would be a move up. But you know, like her boss really likes her at the job she's in and she really likes what she's doing. And so she called me and said, you know, what should I do? I said, well, you should go and apply for the other job. Like, that was what you should do. I'm glad you really like your job. That's really great, but go apply, right? And you might not get it, but that's always the, the way. So she, she texted me that night and said she did apply. So, you know, always just pushing, pushing. Yeah, that's good. I think, I think everyone needs to take more risks, so. All right. Anita, Perfect. is there somebody Perfect. you're lifting up in particular, <laughs> and how are you doing that? Yeah, I'm, I'm working with a couple of young ladies and I'm finding that those are the ones, well, they're, they're kind of finding me and I'm just kind of stumbling on them in my, whether I'm at working out or at a business meeting or something like that and they come and ask you for advice and then we'll decide to go out for coffee and chit chat a little bit about what they want to do and specifically one, she wanted to start home business and 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 she just didn't know how to come about it you know i'm like i'm like well what do you want to be when you grow up i mean why do you want to start your own business well what's your mission going to be you know how how are you going to how are you going to do it you kind of got to figure out what your planning is going to be and and why you're passionate about it and and then i'm kind of like well what are you waiting for <laughs> you know it's like it's kind of like what nan said it's taking more risk and and not be afraid of Making mistakes, you're gonna make mistakes. It's just figuring out how you're gonna bounce back and learn from them. But th there's really nothing stopping you. So that's really what I'm loving to see, specifically these two young ladies. One, she was not happy in her work. And I'm like, then why are you here? I mean, it's nothing personal, but if you don't love what you do, then get out of here. I mean, you're not bringing any value to the organization, for sure, because you're miserable, and, and you're never gonna grow. So, I said, well, what is it you want to do? So it's, it's kind of back to what I kind of did with myself. What is it I want to do? I'm not great at everything, heaven forbid. But focus in on the things that you love to do, you know? And then hunt it down, like exhaust it. Don't stop. I don't care what. You just do it, you know? And, and seeing those two young ladies just pursuing, one texted me, she's like, I've applied to these two places. And then, what did you apply it? an executive assistant. I'm like, your private trainer? Okay, that's a good one. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, but she took the risk and, and she wanted to think outside of the box. So, you know, it might not be the home run, but you will grow from it. Mm -hmm. So, I've, well, what's interesting is that you started a questioning process and that got her thinking. So yeah. you kept challenging her by asking questions. So yeah. I think that's, that's a great approach. Yeah. All right, Shannon, what about you? Is there a woman that you are lifting up and how are you doing that? So I'm going to answer the question a little differently. I know you're so stunned. Um, <laughs> is that I, I right? There's two things, and I, one of one of the employees, my employee, said this. I think that there is a generation of people that are not being mentored in the same way that potentially some of us were being mentored because the dynamics of career um, is so fluid, mm -hmm. and it is even more fluid for women. And so it is hard then to find a subject matter expert, right, in the field or industry in which you want to be in or aspire to be because those leaders um, are either not accessible to you or um, you don't even know who they are. And I think that's a little different than the formal, um, can we have coffee formally? Can I spend some time with you in the office because we're in the same industry and ultimately I'm going to start here and I want to get to your position. And in fact, I would dare to say that there's probably many women in the seats who probably want to get somewhere and it's probably not exactly what you're doing right now. And so mentoring then for me is in two ways. The first is that I really feel that I'm a catalyst. So I feel like in a catalyst situation, a catalyst will connect two things that don't necessarily function without that connection but the catalyst is used up right in the primary stage and it goes away because the, once that synergy happens, you're good. And that's how I want to be used. I'm not really a mentor in the sense that I need to have 15 
meetings with you. First of all, it's exhausting for me. But secondly, <laughs> I think that for who I am and who are the people who are attracted to my type of mentorship want that. Because more than likely, those women are clear about what they want to do. They're just scared to do it. So I agree with Nan. I am the mentor who will infuse in you and pull out of you your fearlessness. What do you want to do and how do we get there? Not because you don't know how to get there, because you're scared to get there. Or you don't have the safety net if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Or you can't just switch your job. Or you can't figure out how to switch your job. I'm that. And I'm saying that because I think that what you heard here is potentially a whole bunch of different type of mentoring. What you have to connect with is what type of mentor do you need and then find that person. I was mentored a lot because I didn't have relationships in mentoring um, because of my class of how I grew up of poverty. I didn't know what a mentor looked like. So when I got there, my mentoring was about how to change my behavior so it became palatable for that culture. And it was painful mm -hmm. because it was the wrong, wrong, wrong mentoring for me. So I think that's important, is that are you in a position that you are in today that you know and you can see where you want to be? And then how do you find that person in that industry, in your job, in your career, in your profession? Are you a mentor, or do you need a mentor where you want to be somewhere completely different where you are today? You have no clue who a leader is in that position. You'd probably utilize someone like me or Nan who would say, you take the risk. Let's figure out how to get, build a safety net but let's take the risk. Or do you need to have in you because you've been beat down, because you've been given feedback around your performance that hasn't been positive to your spirit, where you need a woman just to walk along with you and infuse in you that you can do it? That's a different mentor. So for me, a lot of one people type of mentoring, but I do it in such a concentrated way that I, I don't, I, I think I know when people are successful, but hopefully what I really want to know around my mentoring is that you forget me. I'm just a catalyst. I, I like that image of being a catalyst because we can envision that, right? We, we can paint a picture around that. Mm -hmm. We have one minute left, and in that minute, I have asked these ladies to think about their own leadership legacy. So I'd like to start with Anita, and if you could tell us in one sentence, what is the leadership legacy you will leave? Probably be passionate, but be systematic about it. Shannon, I hope that I leave a legacy of being disruptive. Being disruptive, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cassie. I'm gonna go back to Maya Angelou again. Um, I've learned that people don't remember what you say, people don't remember what you do, but people remember how you made them feel. Nan, you are taking it away. What's your legacy? Uh, I hope I'm remembered as a risk taker that led to results. Risk taker that led to results. On that note, thank you panelists. <laughs>